So yeah, the agenda today, so we're going to start off um, kind of a high level overview of blockchains and Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin's the, you know, not the original uh, blockchain, but certainly the one that brought a lot of popularity to, to blockchains. Then we're going to talk about validation, um, so how we kind of keep those blockchains secure um, yeah. and, trust, yeah, and trustworthy today, without... So um, kind of a high level overview of blockchains and Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is kind of an echo in the back. Not the original uh, blockchain, but certainly the one that brought a lot of popularity to, to blockchains. But we're going to talk about validation. Um, and secure. Okay, um, so yeah, then validation, keeping those blockchains secure in a, in a trustless um, environment uh, without a, a centralized third party. Um, and then we're gonna delve into Ethereum and uh, what it brought to blockchains and kind of how it changed the game and built on top of um, some of the concepts that Bitcoin pioneered. And then we're gonna develop an example smart contract and then we'll deploy that smart contract. Um, yeah, so starting off blockchain, blockchains and Bitcoin. So what is a blockchain? A blockchain is really just a, a big distributed ledger, a big distributed database. Um, we'll, we'll get into in the validation and, and, and whatnot on how we keep that secure and how this, these blocks and these block pointers and the hashes keep it secure, but it's actually a really fairly simple concept. It's just, um, just a bunch of data and transactions stored and stored in these blocks that are all kind of pointed together to give it from, in some ways, kind of like a linked list with a lot of data structures. Um, yeah, and in the case of Bitcoin, the data stored here is transactions, the exchange of Bitcoin between these, between all the participants in the, the Bitcoin network. Um, yeah, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin, like I said, is one of the first original um, blockchains that really brought popularity to it and brought a, a couple huge advancements that made this centralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electronic cash actually work. So, so one of the things, if you think about the computer, the computer world and the digital space, everything is essentially um, infinitely um, duplicated and repeatable in, in, in some lack of scarcity. And what, what Bitcoin brings in is actually an, uh, an artificial, um, or brings in scarcity to something that could be easily re replicable. And so in that, so, what Bitcoin in particular brought is this distributed ledger um, along with the peer-to-peer -peer system that prevents the double spending problem. So it's the double spending problem. So in, in the real world, if you get a $10 bill and you're getting that issued from a centralized bank or some, some you know, country, whatnot, a US dollar, so you get those $10, you give those $10 to somebody, you buy a sandwich, uh, you don't have that $10 anymore. You've given that away. And in, in the digital space, you know, before uh, Bitcoin and this white paper came out, everything was that there wasn't a distributed ledger with the information on how much everyone has and who has what. So you could spend money and then basically try to pull some shenanigans and, and respend that money. So with Bitcoin, it's a totally distributed peer-to-peer -peer ledger. So everyone knows everyone else is basically how much money they have in their digital bank account, their internet money bank account. And so that's all, that's all possible. So people can't double spend and how that's then secured. And we'll get into a little bit more, but it's all distributed peer to peer. And so um, as you're a participant in the Bitcoin network, you know, everyone's ledger balance. So uh, you can keep track of, you know, who spent what, and that's all built into the system. And some of the cool things about that being peer to peer and, and it doesn't rely on a, a third party. And so we all run the network. We're all participants in it and there's no central authority. So there's nobody like a bank account or a bank. There's a bank could just basically, you know, if, if they thought you were up to something fraudulent or if you screwed up or overdraft or who knows what, um, they could just basically shut your bank account down. And with Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin solves that. It's impossible for them to do that because it's this distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. Think about it like back in the days of more file sharing, uh, you know, there was no central authority. So it was really, really hard to take down some of those decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks. Bitcoin does the same thing for that, but for, for electronic cash. So a pretty powerful paradigm shift that the Bitcoin paper brought forward. And so we don't have a a uh, basically a central authority that would keep that ledger, keep everyone's balance. 
um, and then keep that secure. You know, hopefully the banks would do a good job of keeping that secure, but that's not always the case. And so, so how does Bitcoin keep it validated? So it uses this concept of validation in, in, in cryptography. And so these blocks, as you can see in the previous slide, um, basically a block has the, a data structure and then it has the hash of the previous block and then it actually points to that block. So it's all, all connected. And those are all then along with this nonce and that we'll get into the nonce um, a little bit later, but this is used to create basically a, a SHA-256 output. SHA-256 is an algorithm that basically takes any arbitrary input and outputs 256 bits um, in output. And, um, and it's a one-way, it's basically a one-way algorithm. So um, you can't take a, a SHA-256 output and it's impossible to go backwards and try to recreate the hash, the nonce, the transactions, whatever data you've inputted into it, that would be completely guessing. And that's, um, yeah, basically that's two to the 256, there's two bits, um, 256 bits in binary. So that's, that's obviously a very large number and it would just be guesswork, but it's also deterministic. And so for every given input, as long as that input's the same, the SHA-256 uh, encryption algorithm is gonna output the same. Um, and how does this all work together? So here's, here's kind of an example of a hypothetical block in B point. So in this, you have a ledger. Um, in this ledger, say Alice pays Bob 20, Alice pays me 30, Charlie, etc. This number here, the 10737654333, that's called the nuts. And so we'll get into how that kind of works and how that, that makes Bitcoin and a lot of these blockchains work. But it's called, um, and this whole process is called the, two, the um, proof of work. So what happens here, um, as, you're, as these Bitcoin miners are mining, what they're doing is they're trying to come up with uh, a specific input uh, on the left here that creates an output with n number of zeros. And why n number of zeros? That's actually um, used by the Bitcoining network and software to help um, to basically uh, keep a level uh, difficulty. And so the block time for Bitcoin is about 10 minutes. And so depending on how many miners are there, depending on the hash rate, um, they'll vary the number of zeros required. So if there's a lot of miners uh, present, then there's gonna be more zeros required to keep that at about the 10 minute block time. In Ethereum, the block time is I think around 13 seconds. Um, and then that varies just, again, based on how much capacity is in the network. And so, for example, China recently banned mining. And so the hash rate for Bitcoin dropped significantly. And so then the number of zeros required decreased significantly um, to accommodate that drop to keep those block times at about roughly the same 10 minutes. And so how does that all fit in? And so um, using this example of a probability of um, 30 zeros, so getting getting uh, SHA-256 with 30 leading zeros is about one divided by two to the 30th, which is about one in a billion. So obviously that's a, a pretty pretty tough number to <laughs> probabilities to work against. Um, one in a billion is certainly a, a, a pretty, pretty small probability. But how that works is um, the miners will go through and they'll find, and how they find that number is that nonce that we talked about. So all the, the hash to the previous blog, the transactions in that ledger, Etc. That's all basically the um, static. But what they can do is increment this number, and it's basically it is just kind of random guessing. Start at zero, and you get up to a rather large number. And then when you hit that one in a billion number, you'll find a a SHA two fifty six output that has those same number of leading zeros, and it, and then that's considered then a valid block, and that will be added to the blockchain. And so then that that miner who um, found that block they basically then um, get rewarded with a, what's called a block reward. And right now the block reward is about six and a quarter um, Bitcoin, which at the current market price, that's about $280,000. So certainly certainly a nice reward to find it. Um, but that's how we, that's basically how the mining process works. And then how Bitcoin works is the longest chain is um, then we'll always have the same like, basically the, it'll be, it'll show the longest proof of work. And so that's the most valid chain in the blockchain because it's, it's the longest there's been the most computation, like, uh, you know, so many blocks have been derived and um, created on top of that, because like we talked about the hash, the, each block has a hash to the previous one. And so that, 
that creates this longest chain of work. And then it also makes it immutable. And what does that mean? So immutable means because the SHA-256 are based on one given input, that if somebody were to try to alter this, so if I try to alter this where Alice pays me 300 ledger dollars instead of just um, the $30, well, then I'd have to come up with an entirely new nonce to then come up with 30 zero. So obviously I'd have to spend a lot of time and maybe I could do that once, but the probability of me being the one who finds the next or alters the one valid block, finds a new nonce that makes it a valid block and then try to catch up to the other chains that presumably have way, way more mining capacity than I have, they're gonna keep getting further and further ahead of me. And so it basically makes it, we're trying to be fraudulent, trying to hack the blockchain is almost impossible because of this required proof of work. And now there are some ways around it. There's always this 51% attack um, that you have to consider, but that would be basically requiring that I, or a given entity would have 51% of the compute capacity of the network. And that's that as Bitcoin grows and gets more decentralized, that gets harder and harder. And as more, you know, specialized um, mining equipment comes online, it's going to be even harder. And, and what that is, is the, a lot of mining now in these this day and age takes place on what are these called like specific um, ASICs, application specific processors that they just, they're optimized. So it's optimized silicon to run SHA-256 super fast. So the ability of me to try to do that and keep up with this ever-growing network of miners is, is going to be quite quite difficult. So that's really in a lot of ways how the, the blockchain works, how it's protected, how it's validated, and how we make sure that you know it's basically incorruptible, immutable, and a very powerful um, network, and it's all decentralized. So again, there's no, no central authority that can, can take control of it. So it, it's, it's kind of a really cool new paradigm shift. But um, you know, on that, um, there is... There are some disadvantages to that, right? So all these companies are out there producing these machines. These machines certainly take a lot of electricity. It's a lot of um, general compute that's out there that's just trying to find these block rewards. And so that's, that's um, you know, but not really great for the environment in a lot of cases, especially if the, those mining equipment are used on traditional like um, coal burning or oil burning uh, systems, not very efficient, but, um, but yeah, so Bitcoin's probably not going to change, and we'll get into Ethereum in a minute. But this other validation technique um, that Ethereum is actually moving to is called proof of stake, and so that's basically instead of putting together this proof of work, this massive amount of compute, um, instead you stake basically the the internet money of the protocol that you're working with. So in the case of Ethereum, you stake a certain amount of Ethereum. Um, and by doing that, then you have a higher probability. The more money you stake, you have a higher probability of getting that um, next block reward. And then, um, and then, yeah, it's it's just much more faster. You're not spending so much time working and trying to find that nonce. You're basically um, just you've staked some of your money, so you're putting you're putting some of your own money at risk in case. Um, you know, to, to make sure you're beholden to that network. So one that accomplishes a couple of things. So one being, um, if you, if you stake a lot of money, obviously you have a, a, a large vested interest in that network, that, that protocol, um, existing, cause you don't want to lose a bunch of money. So one, one, you're kind of aligned with the network to produce a valid chain. And then two, uh, it's called slashing. Um, if you try to pull some shenanigans and, and alter some data and, what happens um, then basically you can lose some of the money you state. So if you try to invalidate or like hide some transactions, um, you'll get found out and how that happens is through a testers. And so um, basically you'll come up with like a block validation and then that will get run by a number of other people and they will validate whether or not uh, like you, you basically followed the rules. And if you didn't, then they're going to take some of the money that you staked. And if you do that enough, then they're going to take all your money. And so, um, but yeah, some of the disadvantages of that proof of stake is it's just less battle tested. Now these, these, um, these protocols are up into the hundreds of billions of dollars now, um, certainly in the millions. And so there's a lot of money at stake. And so while proof of work has been around since Bitcoin has been around, which is um, I think the paper came out in late 2008, uh, I think the first networks kind of went live in 2009. So, you know, tons and tons of money have been at stake and it's 
it stood the test of time for really the past um, 12 years. And so there's, there's a lot of proven validation of, of proof of work and much less so with proof of stake. So right now, actually on Ethereum, there's basically two chains being run. One that's proof of work, which is, is actually mined mostly with GPUs um, on computers. It's, it's more difficult to make a application specific chip for it. Um, but at the same time, they're running this proof of stake. So the goal is to move Ethereum to this proof of stake call it late this year, early next. Um, but again, it's it's not without its risks. There's a lot that can go wrong. And um, yeah, it's just way, way less battle tested. So they're kind of easing into it. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the validation on it. So let's get a little bit more into Ethereum. Um, yeah, okay, so Ethereum. So basically Ethereum took the concepts of that distributed peer-to-peer -peer ledger system um, and added a state machine, essentially a, a, a general purpose Turing complete computer that exists as a blockchain. And you use Ethereum in, in what's called gas um, to pay for these compute resources and these transactions. And so kind of a fascinating way to go from like a distributed bank account where everyone knows everyone's balance with Bitcoin to a distributed computer where everyone can build basically whatever application they want on top of it. So Back in call it 2017, there was these um, kind of this ICO craze. And what that was is people launching their own currencies on top of Ethereum. So we'll get into an example later of literally how anyone, as long as you have enough Ethereum to pay for the transactional costs, can create their own currency. Um, also, uh, because this is all decentralized, you, you can do decentralized finances. So again, kind of cutting out banks, cutting out the middleman, the central authorities. And so instead of me me giving money to the bank and then the, the bank taking that money and charging and loaning it to you and charging you interest and giving me, you know, charging you 10% interest and giving me 1% interest on my deposit. Um, so that nine, that 9% 9 gap, call it, we can then cut out that and, and you know, I, I pay you or you loan it out at 5% you get a discount of 5%, I get paid 5%. So I get 5% or 4% more than I would have from the bank in that example. So really taking out the middleman, pretty, pretty powerful. There's it's, it's incredible how many billions of dollars now is already operating in that decentralized finance world from, from loans to stocks and whatnot. And then um, non-fungible tokens. So that's, that's one of the examples we'll get into here in a few minutes, but think again to like a, a, an actual scarcity in the digital era. And so fungible is a dollar. It's those currencies, you know, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. It's not different. Well, um, a non-fungible, the analogy in this one for, for this would be like the Mona Lisa, right? The Mona Lisa is priceless. It's, it's super unique. We all know um, Leonardo da Vinci uh, painted it and um, there's only one of it in the whole world. And with, with non-fungible tokens, that same thing can exist in the digital world. So it's kind of crazy. I think earlier this year, the most famous digital artist is this guy named Beeple. Um, there was a Christie's auction. He sold one for $69 million. So literally a, a JPEG and, and a JSON metadata file, actually the JSON metadata file is the, the primary one actually um, that proved, you know, he's a well-known artist with his own address and, and can be verified through encryption and cryptography. And he's the one who, and then the owner of that knows that it's scarce. There's only one that will ever exist. And while it's only digital and, um, you know, it's on the internet, it's it's still the, the original, original valid version of it is, is only owned by one person. So it brings that scarcity to the digital world, which is pretty cool. And that uses a, a token standard. So we'll get into that more too. So uh, a fungible token standard is this ERC-20, while a non-fungible one is this ER-721 um, uh, that we'll actually be using here in a second. And so, yeah, on top of decentralized apps um, and whatnot, it's really anything you can program. So that's the cool thing about it being a distributed peer-to-peer -peer, um, decentralized computer that we can all program and then it lives on to eternity because of that, that blockchain. So pretty fascinating um, stuff. And it really is a computer. Um, so yeah, here's, here's really kind of a breakdown of it. There's a virtual machine that you program on. There's 
persisted storage that we'll get into um, a little bit more, um, but pretty cool, something you can build, build on. So to kind of do a, a quicker summary on that, Bitcoin is a is basically a distributed ledger, essentially a distributed bank account where everyone knows everyone's account balance and verifies the transactions. And think of Ethereum as a distributed computer with a built-in ledger that you use to pay for those computer transactions and you can build whatever you want to program. So yeah, with that said, now let's dive into an actual um, smart contract. So I'm just going to share my whole screen. Get out of presentation mode. Cool. Make sure. So yeah, sharing it all. So yeah, let's let's do this and let's write a smart contract. So um, let's do the. All right. So we'll do Denver Startup Week NFT. So we'll go into that. Um, yeah. So I'm going to use this tool called Truffle, and what happens with this is. Truffle is really cool and it just builds a lot of tooling um, around your smart contracts and it builds a lot of the interfaces to interface with those because they really are basically separate computers that we're interacting with and, and working with. So they add a lot of tooling on there around um, basically some, some contracts, migrations, tests, like we talked about, you know, there's, there's millions of dollars involved. So sometimes less, sometimes a lot more. So you want to make sure your code's very tested and, and, and bulletproof. Um, but yeah, let's pull up this example and do some of this. Um, so it does generate basically a, a file that we don't need. So we're going to move that one, um, move that one. We'll make our own, help if I spell it right contracts and we'll call this Denver Startup Week NFT Sol. So this is dot Sol is Solidity. So that's the programming language it in. It's it's quite similar to JavaScript as you'll see. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. So we'll do that. Um, let's see, anything else? Oh, so like I, I talked about, we're gonna use kind of some boilerplate contracts. Um, that have already been vetted. So what happens, especially if you want to go live with you know, a, something that could be transacting in the millions of dollars, you want to make sure it's pretty bulletproof. Um, so we use a lot of times these like um, contracts that have already been audited by security firms. They've already been battle tested. Um, yeah, so we'll do the specific version. Open Zeppelin, looks good. Nope, I did not spell it right. Oh, I actually need to write install. That will help actually do this. Um, sweet. Okay. So use those ones. We can dive into those to see. So here's the node modules. Um, so no modules, contracts, so tokens. So here's that ERC-20, so that's a fungible token. We're gonna to be delving into this one, ER-721. Um, so yeah, what this does, one, it's been tested, and two, it has a lot of helper functions for us that um, that we won't have to write. So you know, here's the constructor that we'll end up calling. Um, yeah, this token, we're gonna to set this. This is actually like, call it the URL where this file exists. Um, and we'll point it instead of to like a traditional file store, like call it an AWS S3 or anything. We'll, we're gonna put it on what's called the IPFS, which means the interplanetary file system. So think of that as a file system that's also decentralized. Uh, you know, we all, you can put up a IPFS node and then host other people's files, host your own ones, and it's all decentralized. So that once the file's out there, it's out there basically, um, throughout eternity. So also pretty cool. So yeah, all these kind of transfers, we're gonna be calling the safe mint one. So minting is 
Um, while, while it can be non-fungible, you can actually do versions of it. So, you know, call it an addition of a hundred or a thousand or whatnot. So that's when people come in to mint it, um, that's what they're doing. They're basically buying a version of it. Um, so we use that. You do other things like burn, which basically means destroy it, et cetera. So anyways, that contract does a lot for us that we'll end up using. So I'm going to steal. So the first kind of things you do in a, when you're programming it, one, you declare a license type. And then two, you declare the version of the compiler. So this means we're using Solidity and we're going to use a greater than 0.6 and less than 0.8. So that's going to be a version um, VS Code's complaining right now because I think it's it's just set to like the latest and greatest, but we're not going to use that in our example. Um, we also then need to come in here and change the compiler version. So this is the, the config. We're going to be in here a couple of times to adjust it. So we're just setting the compiler version when we go to compile that, um, this smart contract. Um, yeah, so let's then import Zeppelin contracts uh, token. So it's just in here token and then ERC721 and then ERC721. soul. And then we're also going to import this counter. I don't need a semicolon there. Um, and this counter basically is what's going to keep track of how many versions or additions that we've um, minted from it. So it's, just think of it as an index. We can actually pull it up. So here's utils, so counters. So what it does, um, it is, it's just kind of an index, but it, it encapsulates a lot of safe math. And so what that is, um, because storage is such a premium on, on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, we have to declare a lot of the file size types. And so you can have overflows and underflows, you know, things maybe back in the day of programming in C and whatnot, you'd have to worry about. You kind of still have to worry about because there is so much value existing out here and everyone can access it. It's basically the ultimate version of open source code. Anyone could touch it. So it's, everyone's going to try to hack it. I like guess it's just human nature. Um, so you try to use some of these libraries to protect yourself from underflow and overflow. So we're going to be using that for that. Um, to make sure we're less hackable. So utils and then counters. So cool. All right, then we just declare contracts. So you literally just call the contracts. So we've done this every week. NFT is, so now we're just inheriting from the 721 contract that we um, imported above. And then we're going to use the counter thing. So that's just um, counters dot counter. And then counters dot counter private. So we're making this is just declaring it that only this contract can actually manipulate it. Nobody, nobody from the outside can change our counter type to these. Cool. Um, so yeah, protection, the, the public, the private, all that's, again, really important because your contract is out there in the wild. Um, so do a constructor, public, and now in later versions of Solidity, um, public's default, so you won't have to do this, this version. It is, and then we just name our token. Um, so we'll just call it Denver Startup Week yeah, NFT. And then a symbol for it, which is just a shorter version. So DNFT, we'll call it. And we don't need to do anything because we're not doing anything with that one. Um, so yeah, just an empty constructor. And then we're we'll under this function and we'll do our actual mint, the NFT. So we're gonna pass in a string, it's memory type. So it could be memory or storage, as you can see in this, in the utils one. Um, it's actually using storage. This is gonna be written to the blockchain um, because we wanna have that persisted. Where this one is just important to the, the function call, we're gonna store it otherwise. So um, we're just declaring that as memory. And then um, it's public and we declare return type. So returns inside int 256. 
cool. Um, yeah, so that's, again, it's a public function, function and it returns this unsigned int for 256. And so, yeah, we're gonna come in here, we'll do the token IDs and we're gonna increment it. And then it's 256 and then new item ID. Set that to token IDs that current. And then we'll actually do our safement. And so message.sender. So this message.sender, so basically message is um, every time you interact with the contract, this is passed in by default. So you'll have like gas. This is if they send in money to help pay for this transaction, the actual sender, this is their address. So think of that as like an email address or whatever. Um, so yeah, message that sender, and then we're gonna add the new item ID, and then we'll set that token URL, token, token URI, the new item ID, and then the token URI, oh, and semicolons, and then we're just gonna return that. Sweet, that's that's it, honestly, for that smart contract. So um, let's compile it and see if we wrote it right. Truffle, and we can just do um, compile. Hopefully, boom. So yeah, now it built built those contracts that we're using. This is just a couple warnings on that that public visibility part. It's ignored now. Um, but yeah, this build file, which we'll get at later as we deploy it to a, a real network. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. So now we can go, let's interact with it locally. So we can come in here and then do, um, yeah, we're also gonna view, I guess, for the transactions. So let's create a new. So this will show us, this is basically like running a local blockchain. Um, we'll develop. So we'll come in here, um, wait for that to start up. And this mnemonic, so this is actually how all the private keys in, in Ethereum work. So it's actually the standards, just 12 words. And these 12 words can be used to generate these accounts and the associated private keys. And so obviously I'm not gonna put any value here because it's public, but Think of it as like you can actually then if this is this is your main source of currency. If you remember these twelve words, basically you have your bank account in your brain at any given time because anywhere you can use these words to basically hydrate a an account. Um, so kind of cool in that way. We're gonna change it. The truffle uses that one. We're gonna pass in our new mnemonic, and that should be good for that. And so. Okay, yeah, here's, here's that running. So then we can kind of see the transactions as they happen. Um, so what we'll do, we're gonna actually migrate, which means we're gonna put this on an actual blockchain. So we're gonna go into this uh, migrations file and we're gonna change this from that built-in one that we deleted before. Startup week NFT, startup week NFT. Um, sorry, it looks like people would like some increased code size, my bad. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So yeah, we're just gonna change this to that, I'm sure. Um, all right, now let's see if we can deploy it. I'll try to do the bigger text here. Okay, so we wrote it, so let's migrate. Let's see if it goes to the blockchain. So does it doesn't need to compile again, those are cached, we didn't change the contract. Migrating, so yeah, we just deployed it to the local one. And I think when I did this, so this is basically that amount of ETH right now, I think it's 180 bucks when I checked last. So, you know, something you want, you want to test before you go doing it. And then we see this first account was 
docked to that because they're the ones who deployed it. You can come in here and see the transactions. So that's us creating the Ethereum contract. So pretty cool. Now we have the contract live. Um, now we can actually mint. So we can see our accounts. Um, so let's do it. Const. So our NFT contract. Wait, and then we can do Denver startup week, and then um, deployed. So this gets like the actual deployed contract. So NFTK. So that's all the functions. Now we can just call that and mint it. So we'll get into this a little bit more, but we're going to use this service called Pinata. It's the one who actually, or they they make it really easy to connect with the interplanetary file system. So we could do that locally. We could certainly um, write a node or run a lo node locally that we could hit, but it's, you know, for this demo, it's easier just to hit what's out there. So now we're actually gonna mint an NFT. So we can come in here and there we go. We just called the contract and we minted an NFT. So I don't know, pretty sweet. Um, that's out there. We can see the NFTK. You can see the owner of and that first index. And that's our first account. So yeah, pretty cool. That's our smart contract deployed locally. Now what we can do is we can actually um, deploy that to a more distributed. We're still going to do a test network, but it's it's so it's not the main net, but we don't really want to pay the 180 bucks to deploy that and go through that. So we're just going to go to this other network and it's called the Rink B network. Um, and then we'll interact with it and, and see what we can do. So um, yeah, let's do that. All right, we can come in here. So what we're going to want to do, um, we'll get out of this. We'll change our config file to actually hit a network. Um, so we'll show these. Um, so we're going to need to install this guy. And so that provider, it basically, again, it just makes it easier for us to um, interact with uh, the various networks, the various um, distributed computers that we want to and do it in, so in an authenticated way. So we've got that. Um, yeah, now we want to hit the actual network. So we can come in here. Oops. And then provider. And that's actually a function, HD. And then. Monic. And then we're going to use this other service um called infura and that's just basically again a way we can call an api instead of running the local test network locally um again just an easier lazier way to do it so we don't have to run this ring feed node on our local computer um so we're gonna need to create a secret file so touch.secret and that's just what's being read in up here so this this mnemonic that we that was generated so we can come in here again here's the here's the mnemonic that we're going to use um so touch that secret file come in uh, that's secret so we'll write it in there sweet um now we can try to migrate it onto that network. So we'll do truffle migrate and the network link B. And hopefully that goes. So yeah, it's going through. Um, it's going to, oh, well, I didn't like something. Oh, I forgot a letter. Um, and That would help. So yeah, now it's it's compiling everything. Um, it's doing a simulation of it. Again, this is you know permanent code that will go on to live on the blockchain. So while this is just a te test network, it goes through the same um, 
issues and now it didn't like something ran out of gas oh shoot okay <laughs> that's too bad so what um what we're gonna have to do i'm surprised i don't have enough we have to basically um be faucet so this is um basically how you get fake <laughs> the fake money. So we got to come in here, um, get some more gas to our account. So let's get this account number. And so I actually have to come in here and um, tweet. I can't see that. Um, like testing and whatnot must have used it all so let's come in here tweet that go to this tweet and then go to so you have to use chrome because chrome is um has these um these extensions that basically contain your wallet so you can use from that mnemonic to here, so hopefully now, um, yeah, Safari doesn't have them. You can, there's a lot of mobile applications that have them. So we'll fund that account and then we'll try this again. Hopefully that address now has enough magical internet money to get us deployed. Let's see. We will see. Again, I'll just kind of run these simulations then hopefully We've got enough in there. And shoot. Well, that is awkward. I don't know why that's not failing or why that's failing then if I just added more towards it. Well, anyways, um, yeah, this has plenty in there. All right, what should I do then? I don't know why this is not sending. So anyways, that's unfortunate. Um, let's see, so here's, here's I've actually deployed one already um, in the past um, as I tested this. So let's just see if that'll work. Um, so anyways, sorry about that. Not sure why that didn't go, but... Um, wouldn't be a live demo if it didn't work. Um, so yeah, this is just, this is a, my Ether wallet. So this is basically something you can go into. You can see, interact with these contracts that you've already deployed. Um, so just a way to do that, but let's write this. Um, now we just need to confirm that we want to actually mint one there. It's gonna ask for my confirmation. Cool. So hopefully that worked. Let's see, we can view it now on this either scan. This is basically um, just to test a transaction. And you have to wait a little bit um, based on like block times. And then some of these have a, a, a certain amount of blocks that are required um, basically to, um, before again kind of talking about the blockchain length um, before it's considered valid you know it wants a couple blocks behind it so we'll see how this one goes and then hopefully um okay cool so it was successfully minted this denver startup week nft um so you can kind of get the details of the transactions it was created um and then we'll see on this one um so here's an NFT I did before, this is OpenSea. So OpenSea is like, a, call it the biggest, um, one of the biggest where you trade NFTs and whatnot. And this is just a test net. So this is one of me and my kids. Um, I think this is the same account, but I'm not hundred percent. Yeah, here it is. Um, of course it's not showing. I think it could take a little bit to propagate on, um, 
the network, but basically it's this JSON file um, that points to this NFT, which is um, the Denver Startup Week. So yeah, hopefully that transaction shows up. Super bummed about the gas not working, but it wouldn't be a live demo if it didn't actually work. Um, so anyways, that's about it. That's that's kind of Ethereum, that's blockchains, that's developing on them. Obviously it's really new technology, so it's not, not as, um, there's still some tooling to be built, but some cool stuff out there. Um, yeah, that's that's about it for, for the talk though. That's all I got. Oh, can hashes be repeated in blockchain is one question. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. I, I guess presumably if the inputs were the same, they could be, I think that would be really hard to do though, just based on the dynamic nature of it. Um, I guess there would have to be like the exact same transactions, the exact same input for that SHA-256. So potentially in theory, but I think it would be pretty rare. Um, yeah. All right, I think I'm good. If uh, Denver Startup Week on your end, you guys want to wrap it up, I'll stop sharing.